I don't know if y'all remember these old show reruns now probably, but Monty Python, they would always say, now for something completely different. And nuclear chemistry is completely different than anything you've seen before, unless you've looked at it before, but it's absolutely crazy. So today we're gonna to talk about isotopes. We know about isotopes. They're, they're elements that have different numbers of neutrons, but then we're gonna get into radioactivity and radiation. So let's jump in. So this is the nucleus and the elemental symbol notation. So this is a, a, a page that explains this elemental symbol notation that you see on the right. And so remember that the nucleus contains two types of particles. And this may be a, a new word for you, this nucleon. So that's just a particle that's in the nucleus and those nucleons can be protons or neutrons. So that's a generic term for particles that are in the nucleus. So you have nucleons and electrons. Electrons are outside the nucleus, the nucleons are inside the nucleus, and the nucleons are divided into protons and neutrons. Now you can look in, like if you smash protons and neutrons, other things are inside called quarks, up and down quarks and so on. We're not getting into that. So we're not going all the way into the quarks and subatomic particles, but we will talk about the protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then we get into a little bit of antimatter and some, some gamma, gamma rays. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, all of those in a minute. So the number of protons is called the atomic number. So this vocabulary page is really important for us to be able to communicate. So when I talk about atomic number, that's the number of protons. And if you look at the periodic tables that I passed out to you, those are the numbers at the top of the squares. And so over here too, all the blue numbers on our periodic table in the wall, those are the number of protons. And that's how the periodic table is organized from low to high number of protons. The mass number is the number of protons and neutrons added together. So this is the nucleons that, so in, in this carbon 12 mol, or atom, we have 12 total particles in the nucleus. Six of those are protons. And so this is roughly the mass of the atom because these weigh uh, about a thousand times more than an electron. So adding on, you know, six electrons to this atom doesn't change the mass, maybe six one thousandths. So the mass of this atom is mostly the nucleus, okay? And it's mostly 12. And if you look at the, at the periodic table that you have, you know, it's carbon, the mass on here is 12.0. If we had an extra digit, it'd be 12.01. These masses are averages of the natural abundance of the elements. Okay, and that's in Gen Chem 1, where we looked at the percent composition of those elements. What's interesting about the percent composition of those elements and these average masses is this periodic table really only applies to Earth. And so that's pretty cool. This is the natural abundance of the elements that congealed and made our planet at the time it was co coming together. Okay, a different planet's composition in a different solar system would have different ratios of chlorine 35 and 37 and so on. And that's how we can tell if a meteor is from outer space or not, or if it's just a rock from a volcano or something. So you can scrape some of that meteor out and you look and you're like, whoa, that doesn't match our periodic table. The average ratios of 37 to 35 in terms of chlorine might be different. And so we know that that didn't come from our planet. That came from someplace else, which is really cool. So, um, and then the elemental symbol is 100% tied to the atomic number. So this is actually redundant to have the six and the carbon. Because you look at the periodic table, carbon and six go together. So a different number of isotopes will change the mass number. So you can have lots of different types of carbon, but the atomic number always goes with the symbol and the symbol with the atomic number. So, so um, that's why we have carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. We can just eliminate the six because the carbon piece captures that there's six protons. But this is the full symbol that I've shown over here. And, and so that's the, the proper way to write it. So this is the number of protons. And so it's really nicely set up. So if I want to know the number of neutrons, we just have this problem here, 12 minus six equals six. So six neutrons. So there are 12 nucleons, six of those are protons and the balance is neutrons. Okay. 
So let's look at some example problems. Let's practice with this stuff. How many neutrons are in the chlorine 35 isotope? So we look at our periodic table. We see that um, chlorine has 17, uh, 17 protons. And whenever we write this out, chlorine 35, that's the mass number. And that's the nucleons. And so we just subtract those protein, protons, proteins, protons, okay. So what is it, 15 minus seven is eight. We borrowed one from the three, so that's two. So we have 18 neutrons. And that's easy, that's how you do it, okay? What's the isotopic symbol for this isotope? And so that's, the symbol would be that 35 has a, has a prefix superscript, the chlorine symbol, and then we would put 17 down here at the bottom for the protons. So that's the isotopic symbol for that particular isotope. How many protons are in this isotope? Chlorine is equal to 17 protons. All you need to know is that it's chlorine and you know the number of protons, okay? And then how many nucleons are in this isotope? That's the mass number, and so that's 35. So you see we pulled all the pieces apart to just reinforce that, uh, those vocabulary terms. Now, what if we don't know <laughs> the symbol or anything like that? So here's a nice little problem. What element has 19 nucleons and 10 neutrons? Okay. So remember, the nucleons are the, are the neutrons plus the protons. And so we have 19 19 nucleons. We're going to subtract those 10 neutrons. That means we have nine protons. Is that straightforward to everybody? Okay. And now that I know I have nine protons, I can go to my periodic table and find that element. So number nine is fluorine. So fluorine, nine, and then I have 19 nucleons, so I'm gonna put a 19 up there. So that's the elemental or isotopic symbol for fluorine 19. So you can write a little, you know, it's, it's like a puzzle. You've got these three different pieces of information. You can figure out the missing piece of information. It's really important that you understand these uh, isotopic symbols before we get into the nuclear transformations because we're no longer balancing the letters. We're gonna be balancing the number of neutrons and the number of protons. And so if you don't understand the, this symbolism, the, it just it's gonna be crazy, you won't get it. Okay, so if anything I can clarify before we move on. Okay, it really, sh it should be easy. Like you look at this and you're like, okay, I think I got that. All right, so let's go on. So the mass number defines the isotope. So the isotopes have the same atomic number, but a different mass number. So they really just differ in the number of neutrons. And so this is a really cool chart. Uh, like, let's look at carbon. Um, so here's the carbon row. See the number of protons are on the y-axis. So here we have six protons. So this whole row is carbon all the way across. And then down here at the bottom, we have the number of neutrons. So those are all of the isotopes of carbon, or at least many of the isotopes of carbon. The black shaded boxes are the stable ones. You can see stable, right? So those are the naturally occurring stable elements that that of each of the different um, each of the different elements. Now the the percentages here these are related to what I said related to Earth. So these percentages are Earth's percentages for each of the elements, and that's how we would know if we got a sample from some other environment, some other planet, or a, a meteor, or comet, or something like that, something that didn't coalesce in the region where Earth was when it coalesced, okay. 
Now, we have mostly, if you add it up to two decimal places, we have 100% covered here, carbon-12 and carbon-13. Carbon-14 is made in the upper atmosphere, and we'll figure out how that happens in like two more lectures. So, uh, But there is carbon-14, it's detectable, it's radioactive, um, and uh, we'll see where that comes from in a later lecture. So the two stable isotopes for carbon are carbon-12 and carbon-13. And carbon-14 is not stable, but it's constantly regenerated by the sun. And so we'll see how that works in a minute. This whole chart is at this website um, uh, uh, for this, I think it's Brookhaven National Laboratory. And they have all of the known isotopes that have ever been discovered. And so some of those isotopes are radioactive. So here's a nice little uh, animated GIF of a cloud chamber that has a little chunk of uranium in it. And these are alpha particles and beta particles that are shooting out of this, uh, this uranium ore. And these little, these little tracks are alpha particles and beta particles flying out. And what's making the little smoke? Well, it's sitting on a, a little black surface so that you can see the white clouds. It's called a cloud chamber. And they've taken ethanol or isopropyl, isopropanol, and they've, uh, they've cooled it down. And so there's a real thick gas that's, that's really cold. And it's, it's not um, coalesced yet. So the molecules are still in the gas phase, but they're at the temperature of the liquid or even below the liquid. So they're ready to make a cloud. They just need some encouragement to make a cloud. And a charged particle running through that gas will create little water droplets or little uh, liquid droplets. It makes a cloud. And so these charged particles go through this super saturated gas and create little tracks. It's called a bubble chamber or a cloud chamber. And it's neat because it shows you how far away you can be from this rock and detect it. Now, if I have a chemical that I want to detect, um, I have to like get a sample of it, put it in a spectrometer, maybe shoot light at it or whatever. I've got to interact with it. Whereas I can be passive and interact with radioactivity. I can just come up to this with a detector and it's emitting light. These particles, light particles, they, they kind of have the same properties. And so this is like this particle is emitting light and I can just get close to it and detect it. So I can find radioactive contamination, radioactive ores, radioactive samples very passively just by getting close enough to it with the detector. And we'll talk about that more, but what's causing this radioactivity? Let's look, let's look into this radioactivity. Uh, it's called radioactivity because it was the activity detected by radium when radium was first um, uh, isolated, then it, generated a lot of this radioactivity. So they said this is this element's acting like radium. So it has the same activity as radium, so they call it radioactivity. It has nothing to do with like the radio, like we hear, you know, so just in case. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of the atom and what's happening. This is a little bit of history pulled out of some of the earlier chapters in your textbook. So it's a quick review of atomic structure. So J.J. Thompson showed that the, the atom had free electrons that could be stripped off of it if you put it in a vacuum and put a high voltage on it. So this, this metal piece right here, when you pull a vacuum on this glass container and then you charge that metal up negative, <clears throat> electrons hate each other, right? They're negatively charged, so they repel. And so you can get the electrons to just stream off of this surface. All you got to do is pull a vacuum on it, put a negative charge on it, and the electrons eventually look down here. And if you have over here, you have a, like a positive charge. Maybe you have a positive charge screen and it's connected down here. Um, or actually, they have the positive charge here. It's running towards this um, anode and it's streaming off and hitting the anode. But some of them just pass right by and then they go down here and hit the screen where we can see. Um, so this now is really useful. We can create streams of electrons. We can put a phosphor screen on here. So when those electrons hit, they emit light. And we can steer them either with magnetic fields or with electric fields. 
and we can control their brightness by putting a little gate in front to stop and start the electron beam. And so this is like a little electron beam that we can steer around. We can turn it on and off. And this is how the first TVs were made. <laughs> okay, you may have heard of CRT televisions, the big, huge, boxy televisions. Well, CRT stands for cathode ray tube. And it's just electron beams steered at these phosphors, and that's why it was a black and white image. Then they got really good, and they could put phosphors that emit red, and phosphors that emit green, and phosphors that emit blue, and they could steer it to hit the red one, or the green one, or the blue one. And so every little pixel had three little phosphorus areas, and they could actually pick which one they were hitting with the electrons. And then we had color television. So it was really, really cool. But this was a, is related to the, to the structure of the atom. We knew that the electrons could be stripped off and so that they were individual particles. We could measure their, uh, their strength, their velocity, their charge. We knew they were negatively charged. Then Millikan sprayed little oil drops into a vacuum chamber and either hitting them with light or just the function of spraying them out some of those would have an extra electron on them, or maybe an extra two or three. And with these charged plates, he could adjust the voltage and he could get a, he could stop one of these little oil droplets against gravity, like he could suspend it with positive and negative charge. And he would measure that on his telescopic eyepiece and he would write down the charge on those plates and he saw that they were in units they were in units, like discrete electrons. So this one had one extra, particle D or drop D had one extra electron on it. This one had two extra electrons. This one had three, this one had four. And so he could see that, that the electrons were discrete particles with a single charge of, well, a charge that was measured at 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And so that was uh, the discovery that, el that electrons are little particles, that they come out in single units and that they have a repeatable charge on them. And so they came up with this model of the atom. This is a British guy, he likes bread pudding and with plums in it. And he said, so the electrons are obviously discrete little particles. What keeps the whole atom together is maybe there's a positive mush, the pudding part, holding these discrete electrons away from each other, but also together in the atom. So this was the plum pudding model of the atom. And so Rutherford was gonna test this so he smashed gold foil into a really thin sheet. So this is a thin gold foil. And he was going to shoot alpha particles at it. So they knew, again, radium, it's radioactive source. Radium uh, was uh, spitting out these alpha particles. So here's an alpha particle, this green beam here. Um, and it's blasting this gold foil and occasionally a few small particles would ricochet back and hit the screen over here. So we'd see a bright flash here, a bright flash there. And this was really surprising because if it's a plum pudding model, the positive charge is smeared all over the whole foil screen and you have discrete electrons. And he was just probing the internal structure maybe of this atom and he got these ricochets. And so he described this, it was like shooting a cannon at a tissue paper and having the shell ricochet. So you think about a cannon, not even a, like, a, not like a pistol or a AR-15 or maybe even a, a you know, BMG 50 caliber, but a cannon shooting at a tissue paper and having that one or, one or two shells out of a thousand bounce back. So he said this was crazy. He couldn't explain this except that uh, all the positive charge must be collected in a really small space that most of the particles went through because they didn't hit anything. But a few particles hit the nucleus and it bounced back because they were positively charged, turned the alpha particle back. And so that's kind of a dumb theory because positive particles hate each other. So how are you going to get them into a small package? Right? It, 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 I mean, we know about the nucleus, but at the time, that doesn't make any sense. But this is what the experiment is leading you to believe. And so he just made up a force. He said, there must be a strong force holding these positive charges together. And he called it the strong nuclear force. That's kind of nice. So you can just write in your paper some conjecture, you know, and say, hey, maybe there's this unknown force that we don't know anything about. And he was right. This strong nuclear force is way stronger than Coulombic 
uh, forces or gravity or magnetic forces. So it's a really, really strong force and has a lot of energy in it. And so that's what began the nuclear age was the discover, discovery of this nuclear force. So we studied other elements and got more advanced in, in how we um, studied elements. You could take this uh, alpha particle source and put it inside a magnetic field. So we have these magnets. These are magnets. And those magnets create curved paths for your particles. And then we can have electromagnets too. So this particle comes out and it's a positive particle. So it's repelled from the positive plate and abstracted to the negative plate. And so it starts to you know, come out and go towards the negative plate. And before it gets to the negative plate and hits it, you change the voltage. And now it's repelled from the formerly negative plate is now positive and vice versa. So it goes back the other way and you just keep switching this voltage and you can get this particle to go faster and faster and faster. And it's going faster so that its track spreads out and spreads out until it comes out of the machine and hits a target. So this is a way we can accelerate particles and this was one of the first desktop particle accelerators. And so they could, they could hit other elements with even harder and faster targets, these, these alpha particles. And they said it was like smashing a watch against the wall and sifting through the debris to see how it's made, okay? They could even accelerate nuclei in these types of things. And so that's the smashing of the watch. Like if you get a calcium nucleus to smash against something difficult, maybe you see what the calcium nucleus is made of, you know. And so the, this is the advancement. We went up, this is a Chicago particle accelerator. And look, you see the circular track. They have tiny little circles here, so they have smaller ones. They get it up to a certain speed, then they send it around this one, get it up to a certain speed, then they send it around the big one. And these things are miles in, in diameter. And then you can have this collision chamber where you smash the watches together and you can see what's going on. Fermilab got us a little further into particle physics, but it's dwarfed by, by the one in CERN. Here, I think you see part of, the, part of the track is not even in the picture, okay? And then this is the Large Hadron Super Collider, LHC. In, in, in Switzerland, so 27 miles around. So that's, so why, why so big? Well, if you think about these particles, if you want to get them close to the speed of light, light travels about a foot in, uh, in one nanosecond. And it's pretty hard to switch your electronics that fast. And so if you want to get something up to the speed of light, you have to switch it if your little tracks, uh, if your little charged plates are uh, one foot in size and the particles coming along, you need to make it say negative to attract a positive particle. But before it hits the, the, the wall of your little electronic thing, you switch it to positive and squeeze it through and you've given it a punch. Okay. But then you've got to be able to switch that. If it's one foot, you've got to be able to switch it on the order of about a nanosecond. And that's, that's difficult to do. Uh, so we make them bigger. So that, you know, if you spread these things out, you can switch them. Say, if you make it bigger, then you can have them further apart and you can really accelerate the particles. So we're getting these particles up to close to the speed of light. Um, and then there's the future plans for this collider. That, look how big that is, 100 kilometers in circumference. For comparison, this is Fermilab up here. <laughs> okay. And again, it's an older facility, but... Yeah, so it's, they still do good research there, but it's just not the big one. Okay. Uh, here's some of the data that you get. This was from CERN. This is the discovery of, uh, of a new particle, this lambda particle. So this is that bubble chamber, kind of like what I was talking about earlier, the little, little cloud chamber. But this is liquid helium. And it's in, in a huge container surrounded by light detectors. And so they're shining light on this liquid helium and they don't see anything until the particles come through and make these tracks and the tracks scatter light and they take high resolution, really fast photographs. Uh, for the Large Hadron Collider, the data, the raw data streams out on, you know, 
fiber optic trunk lines that go to universities and facilities all over the world. So when they do an experiment, I wish I could visualize this. You have the particles collide and then data just shoots out of this facility all over the world. We have universities here in the United States that are funded to analyze that data. So all of the ones and zeros from this picture shoot out so that you can capture them all without losing anything. And then they analyze and get these images. So it's pretty cool. Um, so all these, the slower particles spiral like this in the magnetic fields. And so these are charged particles and you can tell whether they're positive or negatively charged by the direction in which they, they curl. And then this is a new particle, this, this um, split right here. So that's the discovery of a new particle, the lambda particle. You know, so that's, that's pretty amazing. So you, we've talked about the analogy that's, that's used that smashing watches together and figure out how they work. But uh, this researcher, Carol, said, actually, um, it's not like smashing the watches and destroying them. It's more like uh, smashing two Timex watches together and getting a Rolex. <laughs> Now, that'd be a nice trick, wouldn't it? And that, that Rolex might be a new particle, which is like that lambda particle, or a new element. So you can accelerate uh, atoms. You get, a say, a calcium atom charge by 2 plus, put it into the system, and you start accelerating it. Pretty soon, it's going so fast, the electrons can't keep up. And so you strip off the electrons, and now you have a whole calcium nucleus, which we can look at our, our table. It's got 20 protons. And... And you can get these going in opposite directions. And then you you steer the beams into each other inside your bubble chamber and they smash into each other going incredibly fast. And, and sometimes they fuse. And so you might get two calcium atoms to fuse and go to 40, so zirconium. So you might get two calcium nuclei to fuse, make a zirconium, and, and it maybe makes a stable zirconium or maybe it makes a radioactive zirconium that splits apart and you can see all of these reactions taking place. So that's how we've analyzed the guts of the nucleus, is using these particle accelerators. That's also how we've created, when they call man-made elements, this is how they're created in these colliders. And so all of these elements really above plutonium and americium are, are mostly man-made. I mean, you can see these, these little brackets around their masses. The reason those brackets are there is because they're not around long enough for us to purify a sample and weigh it, okay, or to get it into a mass spec to weigh it. Um, so these are estimates based upon the number of nucleons, but they're not actual measurements of their elements. And, and so that's why those are in brackets. They're not around long enough. Now, uranium, protactinium, thorium, notice they don't have brackets on theirs, and yet they're radioactive because they have long enough half-lives that they can be purified and they can be measured. And so this, these are well known. That's why I kind of highlighted them in gold. Um, notice my periodic table doesn't even have the latest elements on it. So I went out and found this IUPAC um, latest, you know, like 2022 uh, periodic table, and it's got a lot of new elements on here. Um, uh, I have like seaborgium and borium and mitonarium and so on, but we get up here, we have um, I can't even, I've never even heard some of these said, like Nihonium, I don't know. Copernicum, that's kind of cool. Or Copernicium, yeah. Muscovium, Livermorium, so Livermore got an element named after them, so good for them. That's a national lab. Uh, Tennessee, for Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where a lot of the research was done. Tennessee, ten, Tennessee. <laughs> And uh, then element 118, we thought this was going to be um, a really stable one. And organism, I've never heard of that one either. So element 118. So we have a new noble gas. That's kind of cool. So what have we learned so far? We've got different um, nuclei. We have the isotopic um, abundances and, and the isotopic symbols. And so let's look at some of the types of nuclear transformations. <clears throat> so if you're drooping, stretch, wake up, this is an important slide. <clears throat> For those radioactive elements, the isotopes, there's a lot of different ways that they can break apart. And this is the actual nucleus that's breaking apart. That's why they're nuclear transformations. One of those is called alpha emission. And so it's spitting out this alpha particle. 
Alpha probably because it was the first one discovered. And so they just started labeling these different kind of rays that come out of radioactive elements as alpha rays. The next one was beta rays. The third one was gamma rays. And so as they labeled those, they came up with alpha, beta, gamma, the first three letters in the Greek alphabet. So it was really just that unknown period. They didn't know what they were. Then they realized they were particles and they came out of the nucleus. And so what is this alpha particle? If we look at it, it has two protons. Look at your periodic table. What is that? Helium. Yeah, so this is a helium nucleus. So two neutrons, two protons. It's a helium nucleus coming out of a radioactive element. And it's coming out really fast. And it's so fast that it will destroy the rock that is around it. So it comes through and it like bores a hole in rock around it. So you can look up some of these ancient ores and you have a little seed of, say, radi uh, radioactive uranium, and around it you see damage in the rock from the alpha particles. They're called alpha halos. And you can see these little sunburst pattern. If you were to cut that rock very carefully through the uranium, you can see the alpha damage. And that's an indication that that's a really old rock because those alpha particles come out, if it's uranium, at a pretty slow rate. And so to generate that much damage, it had to take a long time for those alpha halos to develop. And you say, well, maybe, let's say you're trying to argue uh, that that rock is not that old. Um, if you speed things up, the rock heats up and melts. So you can't speed up the rates for alpha halos without melting the rock. And so this is, this is a real clear evidence to me that that rock is really an old rock, some of these alpha halos. Um, there's also a gamma rays that are emitted, and this is just light, straight up pure light. You see there's no protons, no neutrons. It's just electromagnetic radiation that comes out, gamma radiation. And, and some reactions give off more or less. It's really the thing that balances out the energy of reactants and products. And so if the energies of the particles don't all balance, then there's more gamma ray emitted to, to give off the balance. Notice what's conserved. This is a balanced reaction. And yet I have a uranium on the left, a thorium on the right, and a helium on the right. <laughs> So this is unlike any balanced reaction you've ever seen, right? It's not a chemical reaction, it's a nuclear reaction. So you've got to pay attention to what's conserved. The protons are conserved. 92 on the left is equal to 90 plus 2. Got it? And the total particles are conserved. 238 is equal to 234 plus 4. And so that's what we're balancing. We're balancing the number and types of nucleons, the protons and the neutrons. And then you go to the periodic table, and if you say, well, uranium spits out an alpha particle, what's left? You know that it has to be 90 protons left, because this is two. And then you go to the periodic table to find out that it's thorium. So look at your periodic table. You see uranium there? Find uranium down at the bottom. An alpha particle has two protons, and so if I spit out two protons, I move left two spaces to thorium. Everybody got that? You see two, two spots left is thorium. Alpha particle always jumps you two spots left. What if thorium spits out an alpha particle? We have to go to 88. Where's 88? Radium. Yep, so thorium spits out an alpha, you go to radium. What about radium? What if it spits out an alpha? 86, radon. And then if radon spits out an alpha, you get polonium. And then if polonium spits out an alpha, you get to lead. And so that's where all the lead came from. All these radioactive elements eventually make their way down to lead. And lead is stable and it's not radioactive. Okay, beta emission. That's another way the nucleus can relax. And it's kind of weird. It, it, it has a minus one here as a proton, as a minus one, that's bizarre. That's because this is an electron. We could also write this as E minus one, zero. You see the zero up here says not in the nucleus, not a nucleon. That's kind of hard to read. Not a nucleon is what I'm saying. And and so we balance everything. 
So look at the mass number, 131 on the left for iodine, 131 for xenon, because the beta doesn't do anything to the mass. But look at the protons. A beta, uh, iodine 53, if it spits out a beta particle, which is a minus one here, then I've got to increase this one by one. I have to have 54 minus one equals 53. And so this xenon, find iodine on here, iodine 53, if I spit out a beta particle, if I spit out a beta particle, I move to the right one space on the periodic table. You might say, well, why is that? Well, this is why a proton, one, one, plus an electron, minus one, zero, is equal to a neutron, um, zero, one. So this little reaction here is what's going on with beta emission. Uh, it, I could switch this around. I could say a proton is equal to a neutron minus an electron. Okay. So I've taken an electron out of the neutron and gotten a proton. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's a, that's a little strange, but that's what's going on inside the nucleus. So this neutron is spitting out an electron and giving me a proton. There's also positrons, which are positive electrons, which is really bizarre. And this is antimatter. So it's not just in the comic books or Marvel series and all that kind of stuff. Antimatter really exists. And if you have a really strange isotope of carbon, like carbon 11, it's got too many protons for that many neutrons, and so it could spit out a positive electron. So this is a positron. And one of those protons then becomes a neutron. And so now we have one fewer proton. So we look on here, carbon, if it spits out a positron, we convert one of the protons into a neutron, and so it moves left one space to boron. Now, how do we know that positrons are real? Well, one of the physicists said, if I can spray them at something, they're real. Like, you know, this could all be theoretical, but if I can control them and manipulate them and predict what's going to happen, then I'm just going to use the word real to describe that. Like, what is antimatter? That's bizarre. But if I know about this annihilation reaction, so I'm going to skip down two. If a positron and an electron find each other, they spit out two gamma rays. And one thing in nature that's sort of universal is this conservation of momentum. So if these two particles are going at each other and they hit and the mass disappears and becomes energy, like Einstein's equation equals mc squared, those gamma rays come out in the opposite direction at the same time. And so if I detect two gamma rays at the same time, I know somewhere along that line was, a, was an annihilation reaction. So maybe I could make sugar out of carbon 11 and stick that in somebody. And if they have cancer in their brain or someplace like that, cancer loves sugar. It's reproducing. It's soaking up sugar like a sponge. And so that cancer soaks up all this sugar that has carbon 11 in it, and it starts spitting out positrons. And this is a high-resolution way to image cancer in hard-to-find places like the brain and so on. And so we call it positron emission tomography, a PET scan. So a PET scan uses positron emission, and the tomography is the computer creating the 3D image. So we can spray these and use these in, in science, and that's what's going on here. It's, it's using antimatter. So who knew grandma was having like antimatter stuck in her body <laughs> and imaging her cancers? You know, that's incredible. We really, it's a weird world we're living in right now. We're using antimatter to image brain cancers and all kinds of things. Uh, we could also capture electrons in the nucleus. So if you think of uranium with 92 protons and you have those 1s electrons really close to the nucleus, there's a non-zero chance that the electron will just get sucked into the nucleus. And that's called electron capture. And the reason we don't really tell you that much early on in your chemistry career is because 
the uranium then sucks in an electron and becomes protactinium. And we're trying to teach you in your first semester class that the elements have to ma match on both sides of the arrow, right? Well, in this case, if that electron does get sucked into the nucleus, we move over here, we move uh, to the left one spot on the periodic table because we've lost a proton. It's become a neutron. We're going to get into spontaneous fission, stimulated fission, and nuclear fusion later, okay? But I'll just put them on this same sheet. Um, and so we'll continue talking about these transformations, and then uh, let's look at some example problems. So write out the alpha decay reaction of uranium-235. So alpha decay means over here we have an alpha particle. I'm sorry, I screwed that up. Okay. Okay, so there's the alpha particle. It's on the right-hand side of the arrow because it's decay. It's coming out. Um, uranium, we need to look up the number of protons on uranium. It's not given in our symbol, so we go to the periodic table, and that's 92. Okay, so what? how many protons are left? On the left is 92, on the right is 2, so we need something with 90. Okay, and then on the left is 235. We have 4 on the right already, so we need 231. And so what elemental symbol do we put with 90? Thorium, yep, so we put a TH. And so there's the alpha decay reaction for uranium-235. It produces thorium-231. And um, I mean, it's optional to put the extra gamma ray on there, but so this is, this is the, the minimal amount of information. Let's do another one. Write out the beta decay reaction of lead 210. Lead is PB. 210 is the number of nucleons. We go to the periodic table. We find lead, and it's element number 82. This is beta decay, so that means we have the arrow next, and then a beta particle. What are the numbers for the beta particle? What's on top? Zero, because it's not a nucleon, and what's on bottom? Negative one. Negative one, right? Okay. So over on the right, this element has to be one greater than 82. Okay, so it has to be 83. Does everybody follow that? 83 minus one equals 82. <laughs> okay. And then over here, 210, the beta particle doesn't do anything with the number of nucleons in the nucleus, so it's still 210. We go to the periodic table, we find element 83, and that's bismuth. Okay. Can you explain why it's 83 again? Um, because they have to combine these two numbers here. And so it's a nice little puzzle. I've got 82 on the left, and on the right I have this minus 1 from the beta particle, so I've got to figure out how to get that next number. Yeah, so that's it. You're just making the left side and the right side balance. Kind of like we did with the charges and the redox reactions. Is it any easier to like, use a, a proton as opposed to like, an electron? That's a great question. On that chart of the isotopes, you know, the black and green and blue chart and so on, down below the isotope, it has a half-life. And down below that, it tells you what isotope, what it does. Like some of them are 100% beta emitters. Others are 100% alpha emitters, and some are a combination, like 60-40. And so uh, it just depends upon the stability of that nucleus. Yeah, so you have to really do an experiment to figure out whether it's a alpha or a beta emitter. Okay. Yeah. And then that's just a matter of, like, if it gives a proton or, or, or it turns into a proton or an electron? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so then... Um, I mean, look, see over here, this is the, the isotope chart. And it, the stable nucleus uh, starts out as a one-to-one -one proton and neutron ratio. But then the protons are so repulsive that it's getting more it gets more difficult to stabilize the nucleus. And so then it sort of turns into a one-and-a-half-to-one slope. So the neutrons are down here at the bottom. So this is a one-and-a-half neutrons per proton slope. 
And if you get too far off of this belt of stability, then how do you how do you get how do you get closer to the belt of the st- of stability? You need to increase the number of protons by getting rid of say beta particles and turning neutrons into protons. If you're up here, you can go down like that by emitting alpha particles. And so that's what the next few slides are. You know, if you're if you're below that line, you have too many neutrons, and so beta decay will move you towards the belt of stability. I'm going to go through these quick. You can watch the video. Um, to sort of pick up on them. If you're above this line, so if you're up here, you have too many protons, then you can capture electrons if you have enough protons in your nucleus, or you can spit out a, a, a positron, okay? If you're way up here in this region, almost all of these are alpha emitters. And so they spit out alpha particles to come down diagonally, both neutrons and protons. And then this is the, this is what happens when we're, we've got radioactive uranium in the soil. The red tracks are the alpha emissions, the yellow tracks are the beta emissions. And look at what's happening geologically below us right now and even in the concrete is we have all of these rocks and the radioactive elements changing into other radioactive elements. And all of this gives off enough heat to melt our core. So our molten core is molten because of the heat generated by a lot of these transformations. So, all right, I'll see you next time.